So thank you everybody for joining today's webinar. Uh, the topic here will be on uh, aerial LiDAR uh, data collection, uh, flight planning, as well as processing. So uh, who are we here? Let's maybe start with that. So uh, I'm Chris Tips. I'm the product owner of UGCS flight planning software here at uh, SPH Engineering. Uh, so I'll be covering, I'll be starting my presentation. It will be the first one and I'll basically be covering the part for the flight planning for LiDAR. Uh, and then I'm joined by uh, Pierre from uh, Yellowscan. And so Pierre will talk a bit more about specifically uh, their LiDAR systems as well as the software. Uh, maybe you want to tell a bit of a short introduction, Pierre. Sure, so uh, thanks for uh, the invitation, uh, Gustavs. Uh, so I'm Pierre Chaponnier, uh, leading the uh, support uh, team here at Yellowscan. Um, so, basically um, looking at any sort of client requests uh, and support, uh, basically. So that's me. Yep, all right, thank you. And then also we have uh, Tom here from Hepta Airborne, uh, who is the head of operations at Hepta. So Tom, maybe uh, just a few words for introduction. Hi, uh, I'm Tom and uh, thank you uh, from my side as well, Christoph, for inviting uh, me to this webinar and uh, as we use uh, uh, UGCS uh, we use yellow scan in our everyday work uh, scanning power lines and uh, delivering the data to the customers then uh, it seems like a perfect fit for <laughs> for sharing uh, what we do and how we do that and I hope that uh, the audience can learn some tips and tricks uh, in case they want to do that as well. Yeah, well, I, I hope it will be quite an interesting webinar uh, with the current lineup we have here. Uh, so let's uh, then get started. Uh, just a few more things uh, before we dive in deeper. So um, I estimate that the total duration of the webinar could be approximately one hour, uh, maybe a bit more. We'll see how it goes, uh, maybe more, maybe less. Uh, we will have a Q&A section at the end. So uh, any questions which you have during the webinar, uh, please put them in the uh, Q&A section here in Zoom, um, in case you're not sure where it is. So uh, I think you should be able to find it. It should be next to the chat section. Uh, so the questions in the Q&A section will be answered uh, by uh, my colleague Irina, who's here from our support, as well as probably some of the other, other panelists we have here today. Uh, so we'll answer the questions either live or over text. And the, ones, uh, the questions which will remain at the end, uh, those we plan to answer live. Uh, there's also a chat here, but please use the chat only if you need to um, tell something to us uh, about maybe there's so someone lost the audio feed, something like that. So that's basically for solving stuff like that. Uh, and um, very common question we get is, so uh, will the webinar be recorded? And the answer here is yes. So the webinar will be recorded. So in case you can't stay up until the end, then uh, you'll also be able to receive the webinar recording later on over the email, so everybody who registered will receive that. And plus the webinar recording will be published later on on YouTube, so it will also be available as a link there. So um, with that out of the way, I think it's then time to start. So uh, let's start off with my part, which is specifically for UGCS flight planning software. So I'm sure uh, many of you probably already know, or at least have heard about UGCS, but for those who maybe have not really seen it that much. So I think this is also a good opportunity to uh, get a bit of introduction to it. Uh, later on, I also plan to show uh, the demo of the software. But so let's maybe now run through the main features of what makes UGCS uh, stand out. So firstly, uh, this is a multi-platform professional drone flight planning software. And multi-platform means that it supports drones from various manufacturers. So if, for instance, in your uh, drone team or in your company, you have, let's say, a few DJI drones, maybe now you're considering transitioning to Artpilot or PX4 platforms. So uh, you can use a single solution for all of these drones. So you can use different drones from different manufacturers with the same software. Uh, so also UGCS installs uh, locally. So you use it on your computer. Uh, you can use it on Mac as well as uh, Windows systems. Uh, so everything installs locally, and plus you can also use it fully offline. So you can catch the maps as well as elevation for offline use. So if you know that you will be heading out to fly your drone in some remote areas, 
So you simply have GCS on your laptop, you have the maps and the elevation cached, and you know that you'll be able to do all the flight planning you need and be able to upload the mission to your drone. Uh, also, GCS has uh, very good terrain following in built. You can uh, either use the default SRTM elevation data, or you can import your own digital elevation models as well as digital surface models. So here, one um, one workflow that many of our customers use is that, uh, especially when flying with lidar, they can um, use the data they have already gathered with lidar to actually use it for more precise uh, terrain following. Because the digital elevation, digital surface models you can create with lidar. Uh, from other point clouds, you can then import those back into UGCS uh, as um, GeoTIFF files. Uh, so um, also the main first topic here is the flight planning for LiDAR. So with UGCS, you can plan LiDAR corridors as well as LiDAR area scans. In addition to that, what you see here in these images are uh, on the top, you have the photogrammetry tool. So you can also do photogrammetry missions with uh, with GCS, uh, you can do photogrammetry area as well as photogrammetry corridor. And also what you see, uh, so down here, you can also plan uh, vertical inspections with the drones using GCS. So here you can import various 3D buildings, um, different KML files. In fact, for instance, when you need to plan some long corridor missions, um, also specifically for LiDAR, you can actually create them from KML files. So if you, for instance, know the locations of certain, let's say, uh, power line towers where they are, then you can simply import this KML file into GCS and you can automatically create a, a LiDAR corridor based on the KML data. That's also, I think, one a quite a good feature that many of our customers are using. Um, also, it has, uh, for LiDAR, of course, one important thing is the IMU calibrations. About these, I'll mention in just a bit. We have them as well. Uh, about support of different drones also coming in a bit. And yeah, I think I also already mentioned that you can import digital elevation models, but in addition to that, you can also import different map overlays. So you can choose between using the base map, which is uh, Google, uh, but you can choose between Google and Bing. But if over a certain area, you want to have an even more detailed map, you can actually import your own map overlay of the area to be able to plan the flights in even more higher detail. Um, then I think we can then probably go a bit further. Uh, so uh, in the newest version of GCS, which we released uh, last month in May, uh, we added quite uh, some new cool features. One of them is that you are now able to connect your DJI drones directly to GCS with DJI Pilot 2 app. Uh, previously, you had to use GCS for DJI mobile app. So that's our own Android app, which you would, for instance, install on the smart controller of the M300. So now you can either do that, or you can also simply use uh, DJI uh, Pilot 2 to connect it directly to GCS and be able to see all the routes there. Uh, we also implemented the automatic LiDAR IMU calibration for L1 as well as other LiDARs. So these segments are actually the blue ones, which you see here. So in these segments, uh, which are inserted every uh, certain number of meters or seconds, uh, the drone is doing this back and forth IMU calibration. These segments you can enable or disable depending if this if your sensor requires that or not. And also recently we added support for uh, the FreeFly Astra drone, which as I know is also quite a popular drone, especially for, uh, for LiDAR use and also for LiDAR use in the USA specifically, FreeFly, with FreeFly being a US company. Uh, and I can also share that there are some exciting news and new features which are coming in the next version of UGCS, which we currently plan to release uh, next week, most likely. Uh, as you know, DJI has a new drone, the DJI M350. And so with the next version also, we will add support for this drone. And there will be a newer, uh, even better terrain following algorithm, which will be coming out and will... Um, make flights even, um, will, will make flight planning even more interesting, I think, for you, as well as, of course, improve the overall flight safety and allow you to achieve more with your flights. Uh, so then uh, a bit of a general overview of what drones are supported. So here is a list of drones supported from DJI. So currently, of course, DJI's main lineup is the M300, M30, and Mavic 3 Enterprise. 
Uh, I know for LiDAR, many guys still use the DJI M600 drone. So this is also, of course, supported along with other drones, which you can see here on the screen. Uh, and like I mentioned, so uh, next week we will roll out the official support for the DJI M350 drone as well. Um, as far as drones from other manufacturers, in fact, we support all uh, drones based on BX4 or R12 platforms. So um, this also includes the Freefly Alta X, uh, Freefly Astro drone, which is not on this list, but uh, I mentioned it before, so it's also officially supported. Uh, then also Watts Innovations, Inspired Flight uh, 1200, as well as 750. Uh, also, we'll add it to the list on our website soon, so uh, the drone will be there as well. But yes, in general, so any uh, Ardu Pilot or PX4-based drone can work with the GCS. Um, I already see the question about do we support DJI Mini drones? So the smaller DJI drones, they are not supported. So uh, from DJI drones, the smallest we support are the Mavic series uh, drones uh, from Mavic 2, uh, Mavic Pro, and now the Mavic 3 Enterprise. Uh, drones such as Mavic Air 2S can be connected, but they do not natively support uh, flight plan. So yeah, just a quick note about that. Um, yep, so now let's uh, discuss a bit some tools which we have specifically for LiDAR flight planning. I'll also show some screenshots and then we will go into the software demo. Uh, during which, by the way, just to remind you, you can also ask uh, questions if you have any. Uh, so yeah, just put them in the Q&A section because I see quite a lot of people actually connected uh, after we already started. So in case you're a bit late and you have some questions which you want to ask, uh, please uh, don't put the questions in the chat, but put the questions in the Q&A section so we can keep track of them and answer them. We'll also have live Q&A at the end. So yeah, uh, coming back to here, which you see here on the screen. So firstly, uh, for LiDAR, we have flight planning according to the field of view angle of LiDAR sensors. So this we have in our LiDAR area scan and LiDAR corridor flight planning tools. Um, since it supports, uh, since only it needs the uh, field of view angle, this may actually means that with the GCS, you can plan your LiDAR flights for almost any LiDAR sensor. Um, so I know many guys who, for instance, they start out with the DJI L1 and then they move on to uh, better LiDAR units such as those uh, made by Yellowscan, for example. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's that's one thing. These tools I'll show to you in just a moment. Uh, in in them, by the way, you also have the ability to adjust the uh, corner radius, um, as well as the ability to do loop turns to ensure smooth flight for the lidar. Uh, additionally, also we have uh, IMU calibration pattern actions. So we have two. We have the figure eight uh, calibration action, as well as the uh, U shape calibration action. Uh, you can also add LiDAR IMU calibration uh, in the mission, so you can add it before the mission uh, and after, depending on uh, what sensor you're using. Some request that it's added before the uh, LiDAR area scan, for example, some request that to be added before and after, so there it depends. Uh, and also, like I mentioned, so what we rolled out very recently is the automatic back and forth IMU calibration segments. Uh, so these uh, were initially uh, kind of implemented and rolled out uh, for the DJI L1 sensor. Uh, however, uh, I know that these can also be used for other sensors. And uh, for instance, for Yellow Scan, I believe as well, especially when you're flying these longer segments. Pierre, maybe you can later correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, it's also better to do these uh, IMU calibrations uh, when you're flying longer segments, just to ensure that the collected data will be uh, good. Uh, so uh, that's about what tools we have. I also just wanted to show you a few screenshots before we dive deeper in the software itself. Uh, so here you can see one LiDAR area scan mission planned in UGCS. And let's take a look at what we have here and what features can you see. Uh, so first one is I want to point out that you can see before the LiDAR area scan mission, we have the uh, figure eight calibration pattern added here in the mission. And if you look up here, so this is the bar where we have all the uh, mission elements in, in a row. So you can see in this case, we have the figure eight LiDAR calibration pattern before uh, the area scan mission. Then we have the area scan mission, and then we have the uh, IMU calibration uh, pattern after the LiDAR area scan. Um, additionally, here you can see the field of view angle. So in this for this mission, this was set to 79 degrees. 
And also what you can see here is you see these loop turns. This is what I'm talking about. You can uh, set actually the loop turn angle to adjust at what point you, uh, or basically when two lines come together, you can adjust uh, whether the loop turn should be added or not, depending on the angle of two lines that come together. Uh, and additionally, you can see that here we have uh, an adjustable corner radius. So the corner radius parameter can also be adjusted. So essentially GCS allows you to fine tune quite a lot of things to uh, make it suited for your workflow and ensure that you can gather a good uh, data. Uh, so then moving further uh, about the IMU calibration patterns. So I put them on the screen. So uh, let's start off with what's here on the uh, left side. So this is uh, what you kind of already saw in the previous slide. So this is the uh, figure eight ladder calibration pattern. So in this one, you can, of course, change at what altitude it is. So typically, the altitude is the same as the roots of flying altitude. You can also adjust the length and the width of it, along with uh, what should be the flight speed. And also, you can change direction angle and number of passes. So how many passes should do through this uh, figure eight. In this case, you can see it's two passes. And then uh, additionally, we also have the uh, LiDAR IMU calibrations, which you can use as actions. So on GCS, we have different actions which you can send to the drone, such as auto mode or upload route, et cetera. And so then you can select the uh, pattern tool and you can add. So currently we have two types of patterns. We have the U-shape as well as the figure eight LiDAR calibration pattern. Uh, so, yeah, that's about the IME calibration uh, patterns, which we have, but additionally, I just wanted to, again, uh, mention the feature which we rolled out very recently, which is the uh, ladder IME calibration within the mission. Uh, so, with many sensors, when you're flying on these longer uh, lines, so this can be either area scan or corridor, uh, sometimes you just kind of you know need to wake the IMU up. So in these cases, uh, for instance, what DJ recommend with the L1 sensor is that every thousand meters or every 100 seconds you need to do uh, the calibration. So in this case, uh, you can simply check this checkbox IMU calibration, and you can add these calibration segments within uh, within the mission. So these are automatically added uh, just by uh, checking that checkbox. Uh, so, yeah, uh, if you have some questions about this, uh, we can cover them a bit later. But now uh, I want to move on into the software demo so I can show you GCS in action, show you how you can create these flight plans, and then already we will move on to other parts of the webinar. So let me just set everything up here. Uh, I'll make this up with full screen and then share the screen with you guys. So, okay. I think that now you should be seeing my screen so we can start from here. So actually uh, what you saw in that uh, screenshot, this is the same exact mission, but I want to show you how you can construct a mission from scratch and what can you uh, change in it exactly. So I'll show you two types of LiDAR missions, which you can plan in EGCS. Uh, one is I'll show you LiDAR area scan and next I'll show you LiDAR corridor as well. So let's start off with by clicking here where we can create a new route. Then you select what drone you want the route uh, to be for. Then let's click on next and click on OK. So now, uh, for instance, let's say we want to plan a LiDAR corridor mission. So for that, we can simply select the LiDAR corridor over here. And then we can already actually proceed with uh, clicking here on the map, adding a few points to mark out the corridor. Uh, which uh, we want to scan with LiDAR. Once you're done, just click on enter, and then you can see that the corridor already has automatically been calculated for us. Uh, now let's add the calibration actions before the corridor. Uh, so here to do that, we can click here on the pattern tool. Then let's go in here and let's just shift click to add it. Here, I might need to change the width parameter. So let's do 60 and 30. So we have nice round circles here. Okay, and so now you can see we have the pattern as well. I'll just move this before the LiDAR corridor so that it's at the very beginning. And then if we want to, we can add actually another uh, pattern action after the LiDAR corridor. So we can again, click on the pattern. We can add it in here. Uh, again, I'll just change this and uh, done. So we can also increase the flight speed for that since the calibration is typically you want to fly at higher speed. So in this case, for those, I would set uh, 15 meters per second. 
And now we can go back to our LiDAR corridor and see what settings we have here and what can we change. Uh, number one is that if you're using um, a LiDAR sensor with an inbuilt camera, then also you typically want to select what camera are you using. Just make sure that the overlaps are, are, are all calculated correctly. So if you're using DJI L1, for example, you can select one of the DJI L, uh, L1 models, uh, depending on what which aspect ratio you're using. Uh, if you're using some other camera, then in fact, GCS supports uh, adding different cameras here. So if that payload is not there by default, what you can do is you can go here in the main menu to payloads. You can add a new payload with uh, just by entering these settings, then add that payload to the uh, drone's profile, which we're using. So in my case, I would add that here to the DJI M300. So the camera would be seen here. And then when you're doing the flight planning, uh, all the flight plan will be uh, planned according to uh, the parameters of that specific camera. Uh, so let's take a look at what other parameters we have here in the corridor. We can adjust the width uh, to, uh, for instance, add more or less flight lines. In this case, having one line in one direction and the other one coming back, I think that's okay. Uh, you can also change the field of view. So uh, this is actually one of the main parameters here. So depending, on what LiDAR sensor you're using, it will have a different field of view. Uh, so just by changing this, you can also actually adjust the software to work with different sensors. So for instance, you know, you might be using, uh, let's say L1 and you move to yellow scan LiDAR. So what you will do in that case, you'll simply enter the field of view angle of the yellow scan LiDAR sensor, and then the mission will be already calculated using that value. So. Now, next is the altitude mode. So currently you have the AGL, and then we also have actually, since this is a, not, not the released version uh, yet, this is a developer build, we also have already the new AGL version. So that's just a small teaser of what will be coming. Uh, so currently the flight height is set at 50 meters above the ground level. If we go here to parameters and then show elevation. So here, in fact, you can see the whole elevation model of this route. So here you're seeing, you can see the total estimated distance, duration, waypoint count, as well as same things such as minimum altitude, as well as maximum altitude. And for the altitude, in fact, you can also adjust the AGL tolerance here. So if you want the drone to fly closer to the terrain and to have the software add more points, then you can do that. Or if you maybe don't want to just have to add that many points, you can uh, tune the AGL tolerance down. So, so that, for instance, with the altitude change of every three meters instead of one meter, you will get a new point and have the altitude adjusted that way. Uh, and so then one thing that I also want to show you here is the IMU calibration patterns. So here you can see that we have the checkbox next to the IMU calibration. And so this means that for all of these uh, blue segments, which you can see here, the drone will stop and will do this back and forth uh, calibration with the maximum speed to wake up the IMU to avoid IMU drift. So yeah, all these blue points, these are calibration segments. Uh, in case you don't need them for your sensor, you can simply uncheck this chat box and then these segments simply will not be added. Uh, here at the end of the corridor, you can see the uh, drone is doing the loop turns. This is again, a unique feature which we have here and EGCS. Uh, for the loop turns, you can, again, adjust everything to make it suited to how you need it. If you don't want to use the loop turns, you can lower, for instance, the loop turn angle to 50. And now you can see we have a nice smooth turn here at the end without using the loop turn. So after the loop turns initially were also used to uh, serve a bit as the IME calibration. So also kind of move the drone around a bit. And plus, especially when you have two lines connecting quite sharply to be able to still ensure this smooth flight in those cases. Uh, so yeah, that's how you plan a LiDAR corridor mission and in GCS. Um, I'll quickly also just uh, go over the LiDAR area. So for LiDAR area, the principle is quite similar. So uh, I can actually maybe, let's do the following. I'll just uh, unlock this. I will delete then this area scan segment and then we can uh, just go ahead and plan a new area scan in this location. So you can just add your uh, points, which go on the border here. Uh, then we adjust the direction angle. And so now let's wait for GCS to calculate the, uh, the area scan. And there we go. 
So again, here you can see very similar things. You can see the IMU calibration actions, which have been added here automatically, in addition to this uh, figure eight calibration, which is set here at the very beginning. And again, so you can adjust everything. So if, for example, you don't need the uh, figure eight calibration at the beginning, maybe you are used to doing it manually. It's not mandatory in GCS to add this. You can also remove that. If, for instance, you also don't want to have these um, additional calibration segments within the mission, again, you can simply disable this. And so now you can plan your mission only using the field of view angle, use the adjustable corner radius. And so this will still allow you to gather very good uh, data. And so by the way, here you can see, so here at the end where the route is ending with this uh, sharp line, which can happen in certain cases, uh, then you can see that now this loop turn is being used. And so in fact, what you can also do is you can even increase the um, length of the, so how long should be the straight flight after uh, after the turn. So for instance, we can change this to 20 meters. And so now the loop turn will be a bit longer, will be 20 meters long in this case. Um, so yeah, that's how you also plan an area scan mission. Just very quickly, uh, a few other features which I, which I want to show to you. So number one is if we go here in map layers, then here you can actually choose what elevation source you want to use, and you can also import your own elevation sources. So if you want to use uh, do the flight plan according to some custom digital elevation model or digital surface model, then this is where you add them as GeoTIFF files. Uh, you can import 3D buildings, uh, not that relevant for LiDAR uh, use case uh, specifically. However, you can do that in case you, for instance, need to do some vertical facade scanning. So if in addition to doing LiDAR missions, you also do that, then also a good thing to have. Uh, for LiDAR, what's interesting is you can add uh, to the objects. So you can import KML lines as to the objects on the map, which you can then use to plan uh, your missions. Additionally, you can actually also import a route from a file. So you can simply select a KML file or a CSV file here and create a route automatically based on that. Uh, and then what else, in case you need to fly offline somewhere, you can also uh, download the map and elevation for offline use. The maximum size of a single area can be up to 100 square kilometers and you can have multiple areas like that cached. So again, I think quite a good feature, especially for those who are flying uh, in locations where you know you won't have any internet connectivity. Uh, and next for the map, just very quickly, you can also import map overlays, like I mentioned. So for instance, here I have one imported. We can click here on focus. I'll just zoom out a bit. So this is actually the location which is around our office. This was uh, flown and collected the data with some uh, basic drone, I think like Phantom 4 or in Inspire something like that. Uh, and yes, you can see basically the level of detail and the difference if you, for instance, compare it to the default uh, map data that's here. So you can see there's way more detail. And uh, of course, obviously the map is more up to date. So in case you want to do the flight plans to ensure that you know, you know where all the objects on the ground are to have better awareness, then also a very good uh, feature to use, I think. And so now we can just quickly move back to the uh, route. So I'll just leave this, uh, I'll just leave GCS on this screen. And uh, I think from my part initially, that's it. I'll see there are probably some questions, but those we will answer a bit later. So for now, uh, I will just uh, stop the screen share. I'll just quickly go back to my presentation. Um, so over here. So yeah, uh, what I wanted to mention is that in case you want to test out EGCS, um, you know, maybe you want to see how it works with your drone, uh, how you can collect the data. So you can also just scan this QR code. Uh, this will take you to our pricing page where you will be able to sign up for a free 14 day trial. So uh, yeah, you can use this opportunity, uh, scan the code later on if you want, I can also put it on the screen. And so there you can actually, uh, once you sign up for the trial, you can go ahead and download UGCS, install it, and then basically try out flight planning for LiDAR or for other purposes, connect your drone and try flying. Uh, but yeah, so currently for my part, that's it. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Later on, uh, I'll be uh, coming back for the Q&A section and uh, yeah, hopefully answering some questions that you guys have. I see there's actually quite a lot already now. Uh, so yeah, now we will switch on over to Pierre. So Pierre, I uh, will give you the floor. Here's three steps. Um, so I'll just start sharing my screen. Just hold on a minute. 
All right. Um, so just before before starting up um, with my presentation, I just wanted to sort of describe a bit the relationship we uh, we had with the UGCS in particular. So uh, basically, um, we started using uh, internally with the Yellow Scan UGCS about five uh, five six years ago um, for our calibration purpose because all the scanners that we uh, deliver are we we fly them um, on calibration side. So we use also um, flight planners, and it it um, it felt that uh, UGCS was really in uh, advance compared to uh, competition, especially with uh, the terrain uh, following features that it had at the time. Um, so this was uh, really good. And then three years ago, I think we entered into a bit more discussion on, you know, you had the photogrammetry tools. And then we wanted to go um, and offer a bit more in terms of, um, of tool to uh, LiDAR users. And that's when I guess uh, we were in sync because uh, I sort of was on the on the, the support uh, forum and asking for, uh, well, could we have this and that? And then you said, well, we're actually working on something. So, and then you came out with this um, LiDAR toolkit, which um, uh, made um, UGCS even more uh, in advance compared to Others, uh, other flight planners. So um, that's what we've been using. That's what we uh, actually still use, and we recommend during um, event or training. Um, so that's that's basically how we how I end up here basically <laughs> on this webinar. So um, thanks for having uh, us here. Uh, what I'll describe here is is um, Yellow Scan. Um, not only um, the, the 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 company. But um, basically, uh, who we are, what we do. Um, so this this will be a, a sort of an introduction, and then uh, we'll move on to uh, a bit more uh, in detail data processing. Then I'll, I'll probably uh, run a software demonstration, just like uh, you did, uh, Steps, and uh, and I'll uh, probably show you the the latest features of of the software. And then I'll, I'll try to put some emphasis on um, on. Um, on, on UGCS as well, and and uh, what UGCS brings to uh, to flight planning when using lidar, uh, yellow scan lidar instruments. So just to uh, go back on the company description, um, who we are. Basically, we 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 built three uh, D mapping instruments for uh, UAV based. Um, uh, it's mostly based on lidar. Uh, we've been doing that for uh, the past uh, ten years. We're now about uh, 60 employees um, located in, in different countries. We have uh, subsidiaries in uh, the US, uh, in Japan, uh, and also in Europe um, and Australia. We, we, we've been um, starting up uh, mostly like a, a hardware company uh, selling uh, LiDAR uh, and with a little bit of software, uh, which was not really, um, uh, was more like a plugin initially. And then we uh, build it up uh, into something uh, more coherent, uh, a coherent offering uh, between hardware, uh, software, um, and 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 the, uh, the the support that uh, goes along with it. So basically, when someone uh, comes to us, um, you buy not only a lidar sensor, you buy a sense a software as well that goes uh, and fit uh, the hardware. You also um, purchase something that has been calibrated with uh, together with uh, a technical support that is here to actually um, actually support you in in any uh, conditions so um, the the philosophy behind uh, the hardware and how we differentiate between uh, others is really um, in in the sort of the the, the actual um, accuracy precision of, of uh, the instruments that we uh, deliver the uh, actual um, uh, the ease of use of the hardware and and that is sort of transmitted to the software so we we try to keep it as simple as possible um, the flexibility of views um, basically we we are not we're not fully integrated with one brand of the UAV we we kind of look at different brands and we integrate on it um, and also well um, the uh, the design is is uh, somehow um, also a differentiator uh, with us. So we have um, payload instruments, lidar payload instruments, ranging from um, from less than a kilo to about four kilograms, 
uh, and we have modularity. So we we not only uh, supply the um, the lidar hardware, but we can also supply the um, the camera um, as modules with different uh, resolution and so on. So this is a little bit of an example of um, of like uh, different. Um, different platforms we've integrated. It ranges from a multi-rotor um, that can carry any type of weights to um, VTOL platforms, helicopters. Um, so VTOL platforms usually can carry a bit less uh, weight than, than rotor platforms. And uh, we also have a specific offering for uh, VTOL uh, manufacturers. In terms of, um, of what we deliver, um, well, basically the point cloud products is, is the, the, the sort of the, at the root of any um, applications these days. Uh, you get uh, things related to uh, utilities, you get things related, and, and Thomas will present that, you get things related to, uh, to cadastral uh, surveying in general, um, archaeology. Uh, these, these are image examples of, of some applications, not all. Um, but uh, basically, the, the uh, sort of a 3D models um, comes uh, fairly obviously uh, at the very start of a project on a lot of different applications. That's there's, there's a lot of different examples as well. And um, I count on Thomas to to, um, to give some emphasis on on one specific uh, utility uh, applications, but there's a lot more, and uh, I'm sure. Some of you um, have been using it uh, for this before. In terms of um, portfolio hardware offering, um, the range is quite extensive. We um, we basically um, have um, lidar scanners stretching from um, sort of short range to um, quite larger range, um, like Mapper Mapper Plus offering um, are made for uh, mode like multi rotor platforms uh, shooting from distances ranging between 50 to 100 meters, depending on the scanner. Um, this would provide fairly high uh, point density, uh, but this, their specificity is that they are nadir looking uh, and uh, very much um, like high, high density nadir looking um, and, and, uh, and, and um, basically they, they, they capture what um, pretty lightweight so they can be integrated on, on many different drones, um, different platforms, uh, while others, you know, when you start going into the, uh, the VX series, uh, you start to have more weight. VX series, uh, especially the 15, still can um, be integrated on M300 uh, drones, for example, so fairly um, widespread drone, uh, and uh, just the same as uh, Surveyor so Ultra. Um, these are the sort of similar offering. It's just different scanners um, <clears throat> and different uh, quality of the of the point cloud at the end. Then, in terms of uh, higher higher range uh, scanners, we have the Explorer and the Voyager on the sort of higher end, which can be integrated on multi rotor, but also on uh, let's say manned aircraft or at least micro lights, uh, for example. So these are specifically designed with longer range. Uh, high high density capabilities, able to shoot even at high um, high speed, which are characterized for these uh, sort of platform. A fly and drive, um, just a, a few words on it. This this is uh, our MMS uh, mobile solution uh, on which we integrate the Survey Ultra. So this is uh, to um, to install on uh, on vehicles, like lane vehicles, uh, car uh, most. Most frequently, and these can uh, actually scan um, from from the from the road surface, accessing eventually um, facade building facade that are not really accessible from a from a flight perspective. In terms of uh, software offering, and I will I will uh, touch base on this later in the presentation uh, with the software demo. This is um, this is. The, the actual um, software that goes with the hardware and it allows you to extract the point cloud and run different uh, algorithm on it, strip adjustment in order to um, increase precision, terrain to actually classify your point cloud and colorization that will allow you to colorize your point cloud uh, with um, 
images that were taken simultaneously to the flight. Um, so that's why we offer also camera modules with the LIDAR payload for you to actually run this colorization, eventually for you to run uh, and generate autophoto with a third party software um, for, your, uh, for, your, for your survey. And the, the sort of third pillar that, that we offer um, at Telescan when you purchase a hardware software solution, we also um, provide uh, support with the, uh, with the instruments. And this is uh, because we, we trust our hardware, we trust the software, we deliver uh, an unlimited um, uh, one year support at the initial um, purchase. So basically you have one year you can contact us. Uh, we'll be answering your queries um, as it comes. Of course, we have different um, offices. So we have um, more uh, actual, our presence uh, worldwide, and we are able to um, answer more quickly, let's say. A little bit of a um, um, more technical. So now we, we're going into um, a workflow. Um, uh, with the software that we use. Uh, so basically the workflow is, is fairly easy when it comes to uh, surveying with LIDAR. We, um, well, what we recommend is, is flight planning uh, using uh, UGCS. And, and this is quite often when you uh, end up, because we run a lot of training with, uh, with different uh, clients. Um, we run a lot, a lot of different demos and, and it's true that um, flight Planning is is quite underestimated in terms of um, of, uh, of 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 what it what it is actually, and and usually people don't really uh, look at it closely. While it's actually critical because it will condition everything afterwards in terms of uh, overlap, in terms of quality of data, and so on. So I mean, it's it's actually something not to take lightly. Um, flight planning is something that is very important, I would say. And, and you, you get consequences of wrong flight planning up to the actual product. So it's, it's pretty important to, um, to use the correct solution for flight planning. Um, and, and what we feel is that UGCS has this capability of you know, multi-flight, uh, viewing multiple flights in, in programming. Uh, and so this, 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 these are really critical if you want to um, build up professional uh, flight plans. So we run the flight planning, we do the data acquisition uh, using uh, our instruments. So most of the time it's uh, relatively easy to manipulate and handle the, the hardware. We, we have just uh, the LED sort of communication and uh, and the button. We just press the yellow button as we uh, as we usually say, and then um, this is carried into uh, our software uh, that we deliver with the hardware, and this is uh, called Cloud Station. Um, lately, we've uh, been combining. Um, initially, we had um, two software, so we had a, a, a trajectory correction software, uh, which was postback coming from the uh, the INS that we integrate in the, the hardware. Um, so we had postback and cloud station. Now everything is combined into one. Uh, so basically for the end users, it's more, well, it's, it's in easier uh, to actually uh, stay within one uh, software environment than changing all the time. Uh, and this, this is what we've, uh, we've done uh, with the latest integration. So, in terms of uh, differentiator uh, or key benefits, I would say uh, for, for UGCS, um, we've, we, we've talked about the, the fact that you could actually um, view um, multiple mission at once. Uh, and this is, this is in particular a, a feature that is, is uh, very much appreciated by, uh, by clients of us. Um, uh, you get a fairly intuitive uh, mission configuration um, it's basically fairly easy to get something going, uh, get a flight plan running on LIDAR. Um, basically one of the critical um, parameters is, is field of view um, and, and height. The rest is relatively easy to understand. Um, what other features have been um, 
uh, highlighted by uh, by our customer base is is uh, the the and and you and you actually described it, uh, Gustavs, the the fact that you can upload custom DTMs, and this is in particular um, uh, really useful when when it comes to um, when you need high resolution um, surveys and and you do a sort of a, a long a long um, altitude pass, and then you upload your uh, DTM or your DSM at, at least into uh, UGCS, and you run the secondary uh, flight plan as as close range as possible. Uh, this is actually something that uh, we have clients running um, in Japan, uh, in particular, when they need higher resolution in in um, in fairly difficult terrain. The stability of the connection uh, somehow this this uh, this network uh, configuration of having uh, you know your computer um, and a and a sort of a Wi-Fi environment makes it pretty stable. Um, the uh, the feature of uh, scanning vertical facade. I just uh, we had a a client uh, actually today running running a facade uh, scanning on on uh, some uh, vertical objects. Um, using exactly this feature, uh, we ended up with a fairly complex uh, flight plan, but this was uh, nice to see in action. Um, the corridor, you've mentioned it, the, the fact that it's, you have embedded uh, initialization feature now um, and this reactivation segment, this has been always uh, sort of a, a demanded, demanded feature, the, the fact that you can actually run from uh, from takeoff to landing fully autonomously. And, and because of this uh, INS initialization pattern, it was always a little bit complex to, um, to, to do. So we, we tend to, to uh, recommend to, to users to actually run this initialization figure by hand. But, uh, but I guess uh, now with some of these uh, new features, you, you probably can run a fully autonomous uh, flight for LiDAR, which is quite uh, good news, especially for large organization where, where pilots are maybe a little bit uh, uh, less adventurous uh, because it, it's not their full-time job and they have other stuff to do. Here, at least, they can be secured and run this uh, sort of um, fully autonomous flights uh, using using LiDAR now. So this is this is great to, to hear that it's, it's going forward. Um, now, moving on to our own software, and I'll run a, a software demo after this. Um, the key benefits, uh, again, for uh, using Cloud Station, uh, I've, I've talked about the intuitiveness of, of the software, um, the fact that it's, um, you, you know, you can process multiple uh, trajectory as once, you can mul process multiple flight recording at once. So you, you're basically saving a lot of time doing this, um, and you can, even um, like enhance the quality of your point cloud by using our different um, uh, modules, and and I'll um, I'll take a little bit of time to describe that in uh, more detail in the software uh, demo. So let me just uh, jump into the environment. Um, I'm not sure. Do you see the the cloud station um, welcome screen? I hope. All right. Yeah, we see so that. Basically, all good. Thank you. Um, so basically, this is the um, welcome screen. Um, what we'll do is um, we have a, a project here um, that we are going to uh, create. There's, uh, well, because of a uh, time constraint, there's a single flight here. Um, and I'll just, it's a fairly short flight. And I'll just um, basically show you. Um, the, the process to generate your uh, trajectory within Cloud Station. So for those who are actually uh, discovering um, the, 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 the software with me, you have uh, here a 3D display. Everything is made to, to, to see things in 3D. So we really put emphasis on, on, on fluidity of navigation uh, in 3D. Uh, so you have your only your trajectory, you have different tools. And here, because we still don't have any point cloud extracted, you don't have any access to further uh, processing tools at the moment. Uh, so there's, there's still no toolbox. So what we do initially before 
um, we extract any points. Um, but first, you could you could extract points uh, directly in the field without having a refined trajectory, because refined trajectory means that you have a base station recording um, together. So at the moment, uh, you could run the extraction on its own, as you would do in the field. But now, uh, because we had a base station recording, I'll just start uh, by so it was a right click, and I'll start by generating a SBED file. So basically, for those who uh, um, have been using the software before, uh, this was the step where we had to go open post back, import trajectory, import base station file, run the algorithm, uh, the fusion algorithm, and then export uh, tra trajectory. So this, this is now built in, let's say. Um, here. Uh, we'll just uh, configure the, the payload, which is the offset between the scanner and uh, the GNSS antenna of the drone. So this can be um, used uh, as presets. So if you have um, always, if you're using always the same configuration, drone LIDAR, you can have them saved. And this, this becomes a bit of a no-brainer. So you just skip this, click Next. Here, um, the, the software will actually search for um, the, the, it will search for base station recording, which are within the folder structure of your data. So here it found one Rhinex recording, uh, which is called SEPT. Um, I have the possibility to actually change um, the coordinates in lat long uh, and frame and epoch and so on of the actual uh, reference. So you, th this is. This is fairly similar to what we were doing in Postback, but it's now embedded here. You can save a reference point as preset again here uh, to save time. Um, at the moment, I'll just uh, accept the, the coordinate of this base station. As you see, um, my flight recording here is associated with my base station recording. So that means that this flight will be processed with this trajectory. I can click Next and here, I'll have the export parameters, which are, um, which was the exporting um, options uh, uh, that you had within Postpack. So this means my height options of so the vertical system that you are using, either ellipsoidal or altometric. Um, and altometric, I saw one question um, on the on the chat. Uh, yes, we support geoidal um, uh, geoid models, and and we support geoid models that are uh, built in uh, the post-pack installation, or you can, if you have a custom GUID, you can still import some GUID um, using post-pack this time. So here you, you select whichever uh, models you want. I'll, I'll just uh, keep on using the ellipsoidal uh, model and you can uh, process the, the SBED file. So this is basically you stay within that environment and you, um, what, what, what is generated at the background is actually uh, some information that is sent to a, uh, a, a function, a batch function of, of postpack in the background. So this, this is all um, treated in the background. So you don't see much in terms of uh, import, export, and, and dialogue. Here you just see the progress bar uh, saying the importation and things like that. So while this is running, I'm just, uh, going to show you um, what it would look like if I had multiple uh, flight and multiple base station. This is what uh, a more operational, let's say not a demo flight, but operational would probably <laughs> look a bit more like this. Uh, so here you have uh, multiple flights. Uh, I have uploaded uh, various uh, base station recording and then cloud station will automatically uh, do the association between the closest base station and the flight. So if you have a flight, so for example, this base station will be associated with those two flights and this one will um, be attributed to the other flights. And this is done uh, basically uh, automatically. So you don't have much to, uh, to, cost, to, to actually uh, change. You can just accept that and it will generate a uh, SBED file for all of these flights in, in one go, if you like. So, um, so the, the, well, we've skipped the process, but basically it ran through. Uh, here we have uh, the various 
steps of the um, of the trajectory correction process that you, if you're familiar with postpack, this uh, should ring a bell. But basically, you have um, import, uh, station, uh, inertial uh, fusion, export, and QC report. So here, if you want to have a look at at the PDF uh, report of your, um, oh, you probably don't see because I, I didn't uh, share this. But basically, you have a PDF report that you had in. Um, in uh, in postback, this was the similar, and you have all the steps that have been cleared. Uh, so here, everything is in green light. You can apply this bed correction. So now you are now not looking at the real time trajectory. You're looking at the bed correction trajectory, uh, and therefore you can start um, and configure the flight like like we used to do uh, before that last uh, feature. So here. You can specify um, the LIDAR profile. So that's the calibration that we supply um, together with the system, the hardware uh, that we run uh, before shipping systems. You can um, actually change openings. Um, you can change opening for the entire flight, but you can also change the opening per strips. So this, this means you can really much tweak a lot of things on, on, on a per strip basis. So here I'll, I'll just leave it default uh, and I'll uh, start uh, extracting. While this is extracting, um, I can probably show you some uh, pre-extracted um, point cloud. So this is this is uh, the one that uh, Thomas, you, you provided to me actually. Um, so I, I run the extraction and I guess you, you are going to talk about um, this afterwards. So this, this um, the, the point cloud has been extracted as you see here. Uh, but not only, uh, as you see, we have a toolbar on the left-hand side. You had extraction going on. You had strip adjustment. So I've, I've sort of refined uh, the point cloud together so that it's more precise. Uh, and what I did here, uh, in addition, is uh, classification. So as you see, we now have uh, ground uh, displayed in um, ground displayed in, in gray, um, and the off-ground, which is displayed in orange. So if I can hide the trajectory a little bit, um, and I can uh, colorize um, differently. So in elevation, for example, or others. Um, and if I want to uh, say filter out uh, vegetation, that's your objective, of course. In your case, Thomas, it's probably not the objective, but anyway. Uh, so I just click on this, and I get my, uh, uh, in this case, my TTM which um, displays in gray because it's only the, the ground points. Uh, other uh, features here to um, consider is um, the actual slice function. So if you want to actually run slices to see if your, um, if your uh, vegetation is uh, too close to uh, the actual um, power line, uh, this would be one way to actually visualize it. Of course, um, it won't automatically detect where the vegetation is uh, the closest to the to the line. This is probably where you intervene, Thomas, with uh, your solution. But at least um, this gives you a sort of a understanding of of um, the relationship between the power line and and um, and the vegetation. For example, if we look at maybe just one one pole here. Um, you'll see that it's um, the distance and you can actually, you could actually measure, <laughs> you can measure here, at least live, you can measure some distances and so on. So if we go back to um, the actual um, extraction that we just ran, um, this is another, this is another power uh, line uh, example. So uh, this was a shot with the Explorer instrument. So as you see the main, difference uh, in, in those cases, the, the, the altitude. So here we can shoot uh, much higher. I think the flight height on this one uh, was probably something like uh, uh, did, did, did. yeah 90 meters. So at these altitude, uh, with, with lower end scanners, you, you wouldn't see um, especially like say, for example, the entry level, the mapper, you wouldn't see as many details um, at, at these heights for, for when you fly at these kind of heights, you, 
rather use um, larger uh, range standards. Uh, and then just to show you um, like really higher range uh, scanners, uh, this is an example of uh, the Voyager. Um, as you can see, we are now looking at something flown um, at uh, 210 meters um, to capture that substation. So just um, to sort of give you um, a, a sample of what what it what it actually um, what it actually means when you have you know longer range uh, higher accuracy uh, scanners in in general and what you can do with it. Um, so just to to finish on um, on this processing, as you see, we've got the the toolbar that appeared on the left hand side here. Um, we can now run uh, various algorithm uh, following this extraction, strip adjustment, classification, colorization, and export. And these are uh, I won't I won't run through all that, but uh, basically um, these are the, the features that we provide together with the the hardware. So um, I guess I'll um, I'll just uh, I'll pass on the 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 actual uh, mic or the floor at least to Thomas. Um, and I'll be keen to actually answer any question um, at the end with the rest of the team. All right, uh, thanks for the floor and uh, the virtual one, please. Uh, I'll get my screen shared. Uh, and, uh, and there is, I hope you can all see it. Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. Uh, all right, so I'll follow the same pattern that uh, uh, that uh, Pierre also had. So uh, introducing a little bit about the HEPTA and uh, sharing our power line use case, maybe, maybe going uh, a bit deeper, but as this is an introductory course, then I won't, won't uh, go that deep. Uh, so hopefully in the Q and A, if you have uh, if you have more specific questions, then we can go through them. Uh, but talking about HEPTA, uh, we uh, mainly deal with uh, today with uh, automating power line inspection, and uh, we focus currently on uh, on the analysis. Our core product is uh, an AI driven. Uh, infrastructure analysis tool, uh, which uh, I will show you later, later a bit as well. Mm, but uh, the idea is that you can drop in data uh, and it does uh, part of the work uh, for you in analyzing that data. Uh, but uh, as often is the case, our customers don't really have the data. Uh, so therefore, from the beginning, uh, we started with uh, drone operations as well. Uh, so we have uh, both, the, let's say, highly skilled uh, professionals uh, uh, who have been in the drone field for a long time uh, in the core team, experimenting with the new technologies, uh, working out procedures. And then we have uh, um, either own teams uh, distributed uh, in, in uh, foreign countries, or we have uh, local partners who do the, uh, the data capture for us and we process the data for them. Uh, we are based here in Estonia, uh, so close to uh, close to where UGC is, is from, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, this is where we operate. Uh, so the automation part, uh, this webinar focuses on uh, LiDAR, of course, but uh, uh, just to give you the whole context is that we work with RGB data. So regular photos, infrared, and lighter, uh, lighter data, and we'll show you this uh, later as well. Uh, a bit about the equipment. Uh, so for for lighter scanning, we're using uh, a long time. We have been using uh, yellow scan lighters. Uh, again, close close to oh, uh, the entire Heptas uh, lifespan, we have been using uh, yellow scans, starting with, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, Surveyor Ultra, uh, and now working with uh, with mappers as well. Uh, and uh, the 
and the birds that carry the lighters are uh, DJI M300s usually. Uh, we used to use uh, M600s before M300 was introduced, but uh, you know, it's a different beast. And uh, often uh, we use the CSM radar for obstacle detection as well, uh, especially when there are, uh, we mostly have customers in the medium voltage area, although the more time progresses, the more we do high voltage as well. Uh, but uh, when you do medium voltage, then often uh, you fly quite low and uh, you have crossing uh, high voltage lines. So you need uh, uh, to plan your missions accordingly, uh, but to give this extra layer of safety, you attach the, lighter, uh, the radar uh, and it picks up uh, even the, the wires or the conductors quite uh, nicely. So it gives this extra layer of security if you happen to misplan your mission or, or uh, have some other issues, technical failures or, or whatnot. Uh, and additionally, as we operate uh, in in different areas, that some some of them require uh, more mitigation in case uh, there are malfunctions, and so in in more dense densely populated areas or or in areas where you know uh, falling to the ground is not an option. Although you know DJI is not known for uh, uh, their instability, uh, the, the the machines are quite uh, quite reliable. But when you're doing tens of thousands of kilometers uh, uh, of inspection, then some uh, some mechanical failures are uh, uh, bound to occur. So to avoid uh, the worst uh, outcomes, we use a parachute system as well. Uh, this particular one is uh, Flying Eye, I believe, uh, which which can be deployed with, uh, from the uh, attachment to the remote. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is the high voltage example. This is kind of the, the out, outcome. Uh, we capture images as well, uh, quite high resolution ones when comparing to the images that uh, helicopters produce. And uh, you know, inf infrared images show uh, another layer of, uh, of data as well. We also do uh, walking on the ground. So for low voltage, for example, the whole 100% of uh, power lines in Estonia are inspected. Uh, by using drones, uh, but in some areas you just can't use the drones. So the guy with the drone actually has to go to the pole and uh, check some uh, some things as well. But uh, the, the requirements are actually moving along, as we see across the world, uh, in a in a direction where uh, where the requirements are uh, being worked around, so that uh, you can actually perform more and more. Uh, inspections uh, with the drones without having to walk in the thick. Uh, vegetation and, and so on. Uh, and sometimes we do use helicopters as well uh, for, for time critical inspections where we need to inspect uh, 1500 kilometers of lines in uh, one week. Uh, then drones today, unfortunately, are not uh, capable of doing that. And even if they were, then the legislation doesn't catch up there. So sometimes we're forced to use uh, manned helicopter, uh, helicopters to, to deliver um, on the requirements. Uh, Software-wise, uh, yeah, Yellowscan's uh, uh, cloud station is one of those uh, that uh, they also showed quite uh, quite nicely. Uh, and um, uh, for flight planning, uh, we use uh, UGCS, and and that, uh, as Pierre also brought out, that uh, it's uh, it's been the uh, go-to. Uh, tool for us uh, almost since the beginning as well. Uh, we used to use different tools uh, and experimenting with them, but UGCS stuck because uh, of some of the killer features. And I think number one for, for me, at least personally, is the LiDAR corridor missions, which uh, do have the automatic calibration patterns. Uh, and um, uh, they're being improved, as Christoph also showed you in, the, in his dissertation. So, Frequent updates and improvements uh, as a uh, as a as a uh, let's say uh, this type of company. So comparing to you know giants out there as you know DJI's pilot, for example, they don't get uh, feature updates as frequently and uh, uh, as possible as 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 UGCS does, and also uh, UGCS does listen to the customer. So we have been fortunate to. Uh, give feedback and actually see the uh, the improvements in the application as well. Uh, and um, 
but you can also choose yeah to to follow the train uh, with the DTM uh, digital train model or or not. In some cases, you really don't want uh, to follow uh, the train if there is a, a line crossing a canyon and you don't want to uh, follow the train and uh, uh, fly into the wire. Uh, so so be, being able to choose that waypoint by waypoint uh, is uh, is quite critical as well. Uh, and uh, for cloud station, uh, yeah, we, we use the uh, kind of it for, for obvious purposes, so to generate uh, uh, point clouds from the raw data. Uh, and, and there, I wanted to bring out one of the killer features as well is the, uh, the uh, path selection or the trajectory selection, uh, which, uh, which to my knowledge, at least with L1, you cannot do. So with yellow scan, we fly back and forth. Uh, and scan both ways, and uh, quite often it saves our skin that we, we don't have to go out and fly again uh, because uh, you know one one pass didn't capture everything, for example. And then you can pick uh, different uh, segments uh, that uh, have the best data, which uh, which significantly increases the quality uh, just compared to to different brands of fighters. Uh, so and. Uh, Postback is uh, used for uh, for uh, coordinate correction, uh, and nowadays it is it is built into the uh, yellow scan software. Although we, we haven't uh, used that yet, so I'm really looking forward to to teaching the separate uh, tool. As I'll show you the interface later, it's not uh, maybe the greatest uh, uh, greatest and latest. Uh, and yeah, Terra Solid sometimes we use it for for classification. Uh, and uh, Heptas Ubert uh, software uh, that I'll move on to soon. Uh, for for kind of the delivering the end result and also majority of the work for analysis uh, happens there as well for the photos and the infrared point clouds uh, and uh, for LIDAR as well. Uh, so a couple of screenshots as you know uh, guys went uh, Christophs and uh, Pierre went uh, through the software quite significantly just wanted to bring out yeah, what what I really like about uh, uh, the software is, uh, you know, here we, we the blue ones are the lines that have been, uh, been given to us by the customer, and this is one lighter mission that, uh, you know, you click the waypoints and uh, uh, and it automatically does these uh, uh, end loops, and uh, in uh, in some segments, uh, so so this is a, a loop uh, from from a closer angle. Uh, and uh, for for longer straight segments, uh, you do get those uh, calibration segments uh, in bit like if you fly straight, uh, then the the IMU uh, gets lazy, so you need to wake it up, uh, shake it up a bit, uh, so then it automatically adds this uh, this uh, calibration loop, so to say. Uh, but I believe this this is. Uh, being advanced in the in the newer versions, as Christoph uh, showed already. Yeah, if if I can just like for a few seconds uh, mention here. So uh, before we added the ability to add the you know those automatic IMU calibrations, those blue segments. Um, then uh, so back then the loop turns were used basically for that, like you said, for waking up the IMU. Uh, but for now, uh, with the newest version, I would say that actually, well, the loop turns are useful. To maintain a uh, smooth flight, uh, but in uh, in this specific case, uh, what I would probably do is I would probably decrease the loop turn angle to make sure, that, let's say, the drone flies simply here in a straight line, and then when it does need to calibrate the IMU, it does the back and forth uh, calibration. Since from our, from our experience, also it's better that the drone does the calibration while it's on the survey line to make sure it's not going anywhere away from it. Yes. Wait. Sorry. I just switched the uh, slide. Uh, for so this is this was uh, this is a screenshot from our uh, maybe a bit uh, uh, or the workflow that we have been using for years. Uh, as uh, you know, the, the work around here that we have been using is uh, was that uh, we we do a like this is the, the yellow line here is the trajectory that we actually draw, and the green one is the flight path that UGTS uh, creates. And this actually has worked uh, really well for us uh, for for collaboration. We have experimented different patterns and different uh, things. We haven't tested out the blue calibration segments yet, as it's uh, quite a new feature. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to, to doing that. But uh, before uh, like these loop turns were introduced, uh, then uh, we used to 
uh, draw all of those triangles uh, manually. Uh, and uh, and when we wanted to stay over the line, it was really a pain as well because you know clicking on the on the line doesn't always add the waypoint and uh, so on and so on. So so this maybe maybe as a workaround a little bit, uh, but uh, has has really worked for us. Uh, and yeah, really looking forward to, to the new features. Uh, and uh, yeah, about the cloud station. Uh, uh, Pierre mentioned that it's uh, really straightforward, and uh, I, I, I can confirm that uh, I won't again go into the software itself because uh, it is it is really uh, how to say it's easy to operate. Uh, I wouldn't say it's simple. It, in the background, it does quite complex stuff. Uh, but uh, first of all, of course, it looks great. <laughs> uh, some people like that, and uh, me included. So the user interface, and that is, uh, uh, I think. Yellowscan has done a great job on that, uh, but of course, functionality-wise, uh, there were no sacrifices. So you do get uh, 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 all the tools that you need, uh, and uh, this is the kind of the strip uh, selection uh, that I was talking about earlier. So you have different uh, different strips here, and you have the back and forth uh, trajectory. So here you can see the, the, the red and the green one, for example, and then you can pick either both uh, of the strips. Uh, quite often we do pick one of those uh, to keep the, uh, the lines crisp, uh, but also sometimes one or the other pass doesn't uh, have all the reflections uh, due to you know various reasons. There's the weather, there, there are different, uh, uh, different factors that might uh, leave a gap. And for, for automatic classification of, uh, of the lines, it's really, really important uh, that we have a continuous, uh, continuous string of points uh, on the line and there are no gaps in between because if there's a gap of I don't know, a couple or tens of centimeters uh, then uh, the terasolid packages that I was talking about earlier they cannot automatically classify you have to fill in the points uh, manually and uh, you know you could deliver that uh, to our customer and they won't be happy uh, and this is how postback looks like. Uh, this is used for to to uh, increase or to to georeference and uh, to uh, uh, use the uh, ground base stations uh, for 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 uh, post. What was the PPK uh, acronym? The post process. Uh, kinematics, I believe. So if you don't fly RTK, then you can uh, use the, the base stations to to correct the, the coordinates to get accuracy to the levels that uh, uh, that you need. And uh, we, we we use both. We use the uh, the mobile base station that we have. So this this stick uh, with an antenna that you put uh, and sits there all day, and then get the data out and import it here. We also use the openly available uh, ground stations. In many countries, they're they're free. Uh, to use, uh, but sometimes they're not close enough, uh, so we, so we get, have to use our our stick. Uh, quickly, a couple of you know challenges. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, gaps are our enemy. Uh, so we we use uh, flight speed, uh, so to fly slower, uh, height to fly lower, uh, to capture uh, some. You know, if there are issues, then recapture the point clouds. Or by now, you know, our parents experienced enough that they pick the right speeds and right heights to give the necessary point cloud density and also uh, to not leave any gaps. Uh, but sometimes it does occur, uh, so then we do uh, reply the missions. Usually, we we check the uh, the point clouds uh, quite quickly, so we don't have to you know, drive back and forth. Uh, and sometimes, you know, some lighters are uh, work differently than others. Uh, the yellow Sky Ultra, for example, has this 360 rotating head, uh, so it's really good, for example, on picking up uh, uh, crossing lines, which are quite important to uh, to the customers. And uh, and and some lighters are not very or are a bit worse at that. Uh, at that. Uh, generally, most of them get the job done. But in, in really complex situations, uh, uh, some might, uh, uh, you know, the, just the technical or physical construction of the lighter uh, can uh, can make a difference as well. Uh, and um, uh, covered conductors, so in medium voltage, uh, there are these insulated uh, conductors, which are 
sometimes quite challenging to capture as well then as they're uh, colored with black rubber basically and don't reflect uh, uh, light beams as as uh, well as the bare steel uh, or um, uh, metal uh, conductors so uh, again using different parameters for those uh, is uh, is critical and um, mm, yeah, forgetting to check whether the base station, like publicly available base station, is uh, is close enough uh, so that you can get the desired accuracy, is uh, is critical as well. Yeah, so if you forget uh, to check it uh, upfront and assume that there's a base station, turns out it's uh, two hundred kilometers away. You can't use that, and the data you captured is not accurate enough usually for the customer. Uh, and uh, yeah, mission planning. This this thing that comes with uh, with experience. So if you work enough in UGCS, uh, uh, we see with you know the new profilers that we onboard. Uh, in the beginning, you you uh, get uh, you have a finite amount of batteries. Uh, you get uh, the missions completed, and uh, the and the batteries are at forty percent or thirty percent. You kind of can use them again, but for a short mission and so on. So uh, to, to to optimize, uh, you know, the, the battery usage so that you land with uh, with a relatively empty battery uh, and uh, planning the places, the starting and end places, uh, so that uh, when you're stationary, obviously you can't move uh, when you uh, or when when uh, the drone is flying uh, or placing observers when you fly fly Vivilos. Uh, so planning all of these missions uh, with uh, with legislation in mind and with uh, signal ranges in mind, uh, it's it's really really crucial. And this is where UGCS comes in with uh, many tools that are super helpful. Uh, and yeah, as I brought out, you know the, the uh, high voltage line at uh, at uh, forty meters uh, AGL, five meters per second, and single pass looks quite hairy. And the towers are not very very dense uh, in points, and uh, with two passes, we're able to get much much uh, better result. Uh, and uh, another another factor is uh, is the voltage. So low voltage is quite tricky usually, as uh, uh, this is basically a jungle uh, extracted from a really tight corridor. So there are there are gaps here. Uh, even even despite the two passes, uh, the low voltage uh, wire is usually insulated. Uh, so just you know, when you're offered uh, a low voltage project, think twice and uh, be sure that you know what you're doing, uh, because it, it might turn quite uh, ugly, and some segments might not be even even uh, the lighter might not see the the lines because of the dense foliage. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, high voltage usually doesn't have those problems. Uh, there are different problems, but uh, you can fly faster, higher. Uh, but here you can see that the lattice work is, is really visible as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, what the customer sees is uh, in our software. So I'll go um, quickly through the to the software as well. Uh, so RGB uh, images. Uh, this is this is the part where you know the image is dropped in, and the software says that hey, uh, this uh, uh, insulator is seems to be broken. Uh, like do you confirm or, or or do you reject and there is indeed a chip in the insulator uh, there are thermal images uh, again this is obviously an overheated element uh, compared to the ambient temperature uh, it's highlighted as well uh, and uh, now we get to the lighter lighter part so this is what the customer sees uh, once we deliver the line and make it a bit bigger uh, uh, there is uh, so the red areas uh, are, are critical, so they need to be cut because they are overhanging the, uh, the line. Uh, blue areas are quite close as well, so they're optional. And then green areas are uh, up to, I think, seven meters or something like that. Um, uh, and, and this is uh, kind of, this is the point cloud view, uh, but the reports that uh, the customers get and use uh, in order to kind of plan the work, are good old uh, PDFs as well. So we, we create such reports uh, that show, I uh, you know there's the line, there's the infringing vegetation in 3D, uh, this is the profile uh, and so on. This is the cross section. So you can see the conductors here uh, as, the, as the blue, blue dots uh, and, uh, and so on. So there are different segments. So this is, uh, this is kind of the deliverable uh, that, uh, 
that the customer usually expects. Uh, and uh, yeah, this was a very quick overview of uh, our operations, a high level uh, overview. So I hope you got something for that. Uh, and the rest, I guess we'll go to the Q&A now. So Christoph, I guess I hand it over to you. Yeah, all right. Thank you, Tom. It's actually super interesting uh, for me as well to learn, uh, you know, a bit more about so how uh, about some details of how do you actually do parallel inspections, what do you deliver to the customer, and so on. So, and I think that probably many of you watching this also found this super interesting. So, uh, in any case, with uh, with that done, so thank you, Pierre, and thank you, Tom, uh, for your presentations. Let's now go in the Q and A section. So I'll just uh, briefly share my presentation just so we have something uh, here on the screen. And then, yeah, so now uh, let's go in the Q&A. Uh, let's first address some questions which are already in the Q&A section of Zoom. And then, so while we do that, uh, so you guys, if you have any other question which you feel was not uh, answered, then we will try to answer it as well. So please uh, make sure to put any questions in the Q and A section? Uh, so then, um, from where do we start? Uh, okay, so we have one request for the um, are are Oscar units available for a rental? Uh, Pierre, maybe you can mention a bit. Uh, so from a yellow scan uh, point of view, yellow scan as a as a company, we 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 don't uh, rent it out. We leave our uh, distributor network to actually. Uh, handle this. Um, so it, it really depends on uh, where this uh, customer is based and uh, which representative he, he has uh, in the region. Uh, uh, they're, based in the, they're based in Florida, as I understand. So yeah, they'll need to uh, reach out to their um, distributor uh, frontier precision um, and, and, and ask uh, if they offer this uh, service. Uh, and I guess they are so there's probably a there's probably a way to actually get access to this. For yeah. sure. All right, and, we'll and, and actually, uh, actually, can also uh, second Frontier Precision. They're also a very good uh, reseller of ours and our partner in the USA. So yeah, if you're located in Florida and want to learn more about UGCS and you know maybe uh, also get working with Yellow Scan lidars, so you can reach out to Frontier Precision. So it's a shout out to them. A really cool company. Yep. Um, then let's let's go further to some questions which we have. Um, okay, we'll have one question about uh, map catching in EGCS, uh, as well as connecting uh, here link. Uh, well, basically connecting pixel based UAVs to the EGCS. So uh, I'll take this one, of course. So uh, firstly, when you do the map catching in UGCS, uh, just to remove any confusion, so you do that on the desktop. So you're not catching actually maps on the uh, mobile device. But when you catch the maps in elevation on the desktop in UGCS, what you can do is if you are, for example, using uh, UGCS for DJI mobile app, then in that you can simply choose uh, that. Well, basically you will see uh, the uh, depending on what drone you're using, you will see the maps there. Uh, with certain drones, uh, you might not see the maps due to some restrictions which the controllers themselves and the Android running there has. Uh, but in those cases, still you will be able to upload the flight plans since they will be planned in EGCS, and the flight plans will be set, uh, uploaded relative to the uh, takeoff location. So that's not nothing to worry about if you don't see the maps on the mobile controller, as long as you have everything on the uh, on your uh, laptop where you'll have GCS running, then everything is good. Uh, and then also uh, equivalent tablet application for the here link. So to connect here link to GCS, firstly, we have this instruction on our uh, manuals site. So you can go to manuals.egcs.com uh, and uh, then you can also there find instruction how to connect here link to EGCS. So any uh, PSOC based UAV that is using here link, you can also connect it to EGCS. However, we don't have a specific Android app, but you can simply connect it uh, directly to EGCS and you will see the drone there, be able to plan the missions and upload them. Uh, so uh, that I believe answers that. Oh, um, one question, uh, I suppose, uh, for you, Pierre, is about onboard data recording. So I saw actually this question, I believe, from two separate um, uh, 
viewers of the webinar. So uh, how much onboard data can the yellow scan LIDAR store? So let's say if somebody is flying for two or three hours, uh, so yeah, how much data can they store on board the uh, LIDAR unit? Uh, so the, the, the LIDAR unit is supplied with a 250 gig uh, USB drive. Uh, and then it will depend on uh, the amount of, uh, it will depend on the LIDAR instrument that uh, we are talking about. So for the entry levels, uh, we are talking about uh, in the uh, order of uh, 40, 60 gig an hour. So you can go for two, three hours and more uh, on those 256 gig drives. Uh, for the higher range, um, uh, scanners like uh, let, let's say the, the maximum range would be the Voyager pulsing at at uh, 1,800 uh, um, million well 1.8 million pulse per second you would uh, you would probably generate about uh, 200 gigs um, per hour so therefore if you uh, you you we, we have the options of having 512 gig uh, drive so you would probably need that and this would uh, give you about yeah two hours of uh, recording on on this higher end system so with the with the higher rate uh, of pulses so two three hours is is um, at least what we could do for like the minimum for entry levels um, for higher end system yeah two hours probably yeah okay thank you I think this answers the question and yeah so obviously if with the higher end systems, you just simply get more data. So you'll have better quality data as a result. But uh, yeah, let's also keep in mind. So, you know, with most drones, uh, you know, they still have a flight time of, let's say for the same M300, you can basically fly for about 30 to 40 minutes. But I suppose, yeah, in the case when someone is using hybrid drones, then still, I, I believe you can fly for a few hours and be able to collect uh, and record the data. So, Correct. okay. You'll still be able to use a, a single USB drive and then you have an extra one. So yeah, plenty of space. Oh, okay, perfect. So thank you to answer this question. Uh, so then let's, uh, not the question, but uh, I just wanted to mention. So Alejandra was very impressed with how uh, it can uh, pick up the cables. I believe this, uh, he left the comment when it was, um, uh, I think when you Pierre was showing the, um, example from the uh well also with the, with the power lines uh in in the plant i think that was also really really impressive to see all of the little details there um so uh but moving on to the next question uh i'm not sure if you can share this but uh we have a question about so what is the cost of yellow scan voyager so um if you can share this but if not well, i can i can probably uh share in terms of uh ranges uh because there are a lot of options as as uh as usual you can uh you can uh, change uh the uh ins inside the quality of the ins can be a uh, uh sort of a uh, sort of a, a lower and then you have a higher hand so you have multiple options but uh, basically you're ranging between um let's say uh 200 to 280 uh grand basically for this uh type of scanners, uh, hardware and, and software included. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. So I think, yeah, for, for especially top of the line unit like that, I think it's a very, very reasonable price. So, okay, I hope that answers uh, that question, uh, Jake, for you. Then uh, next about, is the sensor identifying the individual power lines with uh, brake lines? So I, think that it did identify the brake lines, but maybe correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, the individual power lines with the brake lines, um, well, again, it will depend on, on the, the scanner used. Um, uh, th but... This was, I think, the, Voy the Voyager, because uh, it's the same person who's asking about the Voyager scanner. Okay, uh, we can check on the, on the this, but I think it, it did actually pick up quite a few details, including the brake lines, but um, yeah, this, and this was a, a flight alt altitude at uh, 200. This was a single flight, 200 meters, shooting at, at uh, maximum PRF, so pulse. And from, from what I understood from the, uh, the actual, um, the, 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 the actual company that was managing the, the site, well, they seem 
happy to actually capture all the details they, they wanted. So I guess this includes the, the specific break lines in that case. Yeah, okay, okay. So uh, thank you about that. And actually 200 meters, wow, it's, it's super, uh, super impressive. Yeah. Was this flown with the drone or with some manned aircraft? No, I was M600 um, from top of a building uh, <laughs> directly and, and uh, flown. Um, we, we had to we had to stay kind of away from all these interferences. So sure. to play it safe, uh, we wanted to be quite 100 meters away, if not more. So we planned it at 200. And uh, well, I was not really expecting this level of details, but yeah, that's what we actually got. So yeah, this was a really interesting flight. Super, it was super impressive. Yeah, it was also uh, was really interesting to look at the data set. Maybe after the webinar at some point, you can also sh share some more uh, of it. So if yep. you uh, write some posts, something like that Pleasure. after, then it would be interesting yep. to also include that. Okay, so uh, this then also answers that question. Uh, then uh, I have a question about, uh, can you perform in offshore wind farms? Um, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure how uh, LIDARs would be used in this case for offshore wind farms. Uh, maybe you guys know a bit more about the specific application, or maybe you have also encountered this sort of question. Uh, well, in, in my case, yeah, we, we've had the client actually willing to um, do some inspections, um, but then comes um, the, the actual flight plan uh, question, uh, how to actually um, best uh, map these kind of vertical features. Uh, so it, it relates a little bit to telecom towers and things like that, which are objects that are a bit tricky to to scan. Um, yeah. But uh, but it basically we we try to to scan it from different uh, uh, ways, from different uh, uh, angles, uh, one way, another way, and then we try to use uh, the uh, alignment algorithm to to actually try to um, have the, uh, optimized accuracy and precision on the point cloud. Um, but then it, it it really depends on what you're trying to achieve with this kind of uh, of information. If it's to uh, characterize uh, fractures like micro fractures on the blade, then maybe that's not the appropriate tool and, and you'll need to revise a few things. If it's to uh, actually measure um, the angles of the, of the blades or how it actually uh, behaves, then then you you might uh, be successful, but it, it really it really is different uh, according to the application. So I wouldn't say well for sure you'll perform uh, on this application because it, it really depends on what you want to do at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah and that makes if sense. I might, might yeah. add, uh, if I might add, then uh, lighter models are uh, for once used, you know, for me mechanical let's say engineering purposes. So you can measure stuff. Uh, you can you know measure vegetation around those as well. But one thing that uh, they are used as well for are digital twins. So to create the digital representation of your your asset. Uh, speaking about offshore, the oil rigs are quite a good example. They're really complex and have many, many elements. And then you you know you can walk around the three D three D oil rig. Uh, and similarly with uh, uh, with uh, wind farms, because you know they're hard uh, hard to access uh, if you can and uh, you know if you have the if you can scan them and if you have the digital twin and you need to do some measurements, you need to do whatever, uh, you have a photorealistic digital twin, then you can do that without hiring a boat and going uh, going offshore. So some companies do that approach and uh, and are quite uh, quite invested in you know those digital twin movements uh, to, to have the representation, uh, online representation of their physical assets. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, so I think this also then answers uh, Alejandro after your question. Uh, and uh, if you will be interested in maybe knowing more or asking us more questions about the offshore wind farms, then um, yeah, after the webinar, when you receive the recording, you know, feel free to reach uh, back to us and then we can provide you with some more information. Um, so then let's see what else uh, we have. Oh, yeah, I, I suppose, Pierre, this one's probably also for you. Uh, is there some existing functionality to identify and clip out features uh, identified by KML shapefile in Yellowscan? For example, uh, power poles in a power line inspection. Uh, all right. 
well, at the moment, the, the, the sort of import of geometry functionalities are uh, relatively limited in, in Cloud Station. So to, um, to answer quickly, uh, no, we don't have this feature, uh, but uh, we're definitely working on this um, because we, we're trying to implement uh, more geometries in, in the viewer. So this, this will definitely be um, a priority in, in the future. So please stay tuned. Um, we'll, we'll work on that. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I believe then this probably covers, uh, covers everything. Uh, but okay, I think then aside from that, uh, we can uh, conclude today's webinar. So I just want to say a big thank you uh, to both of you guys for coming today and for joining. To me as well, it was uh, super interesting to uh, listen to your presentations and I believe for everybody visiting it was as well. So uh, later on, we will uh, publish the webinar recording, which you can then rewatch in case you missed some parts. And yeah, so uh, thank you and then see you in the next one. Thank you for joining. Thanks. Thank you. Steps. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Nice evening. Bye.